We have questions and today the questions are of the cultural type. That's because I'll be chatting to the head of dance here at Aswara or the National Arts Academy, Mr. Joseph Gonzalez. Now Joseph is not only the head of dance here, but he's also a choreographer whose work is known internationally. I hope his talent rubs off on me. My name is Said Ferdino Omar and this is In Person. Joseph, it is such an honor. Thank you for having us here. Thank you. Thank you so much. I can see that, you know, the atmosphere here, all the students around. I mean, you'll be able to see the students in a bit, but the students are so energetic. Uh, well, yes, yes, that's true. I suppose, yes. It, this is really a lovely place. Mm -hmm. uh, Aswara is, I think, the place where the government of Malaysia really spends its money the best oh, right. in educating okay. young people mm -hmm. because we are fully funded by the government through the Ministry of Information, Communication and Culture. Mm -hmm. So this is a heavily subsidized performing arts program. Mm -hmm. We do uh, music, theatre, dance, writing, film uh, and Sunny Halos, uh, which is what? Fine, fine art. Yes, fine That's art. Right. <laughs> so it's a great place with full of young energy and very, very talented people. So it's I love being here, it's my life. You know? So, and you play the role of the head of dance, yeah? Yes. Okay, here's a, I, I suppose this is a million dollar question, uh, Joseph. Um, why do you dance? Is it because, can you hear the energy from the people? Wow. Okay, why do you dance? Do you dance because that earns you a living, or do you dance because your feet don't know, you know, how not to? It's a very interesting question. Um, the truth is, you know, uh, I think dance is a vocation that called me. I was actually a student of mathematics at University of Malaya mm -hmm. in the early days. And mathematics? Then, yes. Never would have thought. Yeah, <laughs> so I have a Bachelor of Science, you know. Mm -hmm. But uh, in those days, um, you know, I, I think being young is about trying to look for your space and find your path and look for opportunities and so on. So I was very, very involved in film and the theatre when mm -hmm. I was young. I did a lot of radio plays from the time I was 10 years old. Mm -hmm. And sort of the movement into dance was really quite by chance and I really didn't expect that it would become my career. Mm -hmm. But what I did do was always tell myself to be open, mm -hmm. to be prepared and to accept challenges and to push myself in directions that perhaps is not the norm. Mm -hmm. And I did and you know it led me from one place to another you know and I've been here for 30 years uh, not here meaning in dance in dance in, and the, I, industry, in yeah. the industry for 30 years and I've loved all of it. Mm -hmm. it it hasn't all been a bit of roses a lot of challenges but I do believe as cliched as it sounds mm -hmm. that the challenges really make you who you are mm -hmm. and build your personality and, and of so course on. as that saying you know why don't we start walking mm -hmm. I sure. think the students are going to class I want to join them oh sure yeah <laughs> that would be great yes I've brought change of clothes and everything okay. no but um, uh, there is a saying that you know that goes like you know those who don't teach yes um, but you clearly don't don't you do yes so why now teach well the, the truth is I think in Malaysia you cannot just be one type of person. You can't just be solely a performer without having that teaching element. So very, very early on in my career, even when I was in my 20s, I started performing extensively, but along with that performance, I started teaching as well. So it kind of went hand in hand. Right. And uh, I think teaching sort of gives you a little bit more stability because of the consistency mm -hmm. and also the excitement of developing new talent. I've always had that. And I think many, many, many performers have it. Though not all performers make good teachers, you know. Right. So right. I think that the interest in passing on knowledge or just sharing uh, interacting within a studio was always very strong for me. So I still do, as you say, uh, and I enjoy doing very much. And I believe one of the best ways for the students to learn is by realizing that their teachers can still do and still perform. Right. You know? So I think that's very important. And of course, and you have a lot to share with them. I mean, I am walking here with the first Malaysian ever to have performed in the West End. I lived in London for many, many years and I know right what West End is like. Yes. Congratulations on that. <laughs> Thank you. It was a long time ago. And I'm not really 100% sure whether I was the first Malaysian. I'm not Well, really... general literature says you are the yeah, first. Yeah, I'm not sure. But uh, I didn't put that literature out. Uh, but uh, I think it's important to realise that 
whether first or not, I don't know, but I certainly was one of the few. Mm -hmm. I think there haven't been more than five who mm -hmm. have done it. I mean, Sean Ghazi Sean certainly Gazi is one, one of the, the most amazing ones yes. who's uh, had big roles. David Lee, uh, he's still in London. I think he's the most successful Malaysian in musical theatre. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there's Uku Majid, uh, Vic Nendran Sivalingam, mm -hmm. uh, Lao Ming Yam and a few others. So mm -hmm. a very small select group, but I think all of us had a dream at that time. And it was... Was the West End the pinnacle of that dream? Yes, at that time. At that time. At that time. What is the dream But now? you know, it's so amazing that you talk about how dreams change. Uh -huh. how, you, how you scale a certain peak uh -huh. and then you realize that there's another peak to scale. So the reason that uh, the West End was big for me at that time was because my first dance class was at the age of 21. Mm -hmm. Nobody would have ever given me the opportunity or the possibility of saying, you know, Joseph, you can make it to the West End. Mm -hmm. I didn't even know what the West End was. I, I learned about it as time went on. And when I went to study in London, I realized that this is what I want to do. Mm -hmm. And before the age of 30, I want to see my name on a poster in the West End. And I did, and it's unbelievable. At what age did that dream 30. come true? At 30. It did, you know. So, right on the so <laughs> mathematician in yeah, you. Yeah, right. it lives. Uh, I think, so, yes. yes. So, uh, so, West End and several other performances yes. all around Asia, all around the world. Yes. Here, um, in groups, in, in, in troops. Now, has there been any point in your life that you know, where you stopped and thought, I've done it all? Or do you think there's more to come? Uh, no. Uh, I've never ever thought that that's enough. Mm -hmm. I have been very, very frustrated from time to time. Uh -huh. uh, I think uh, coming back to Malaysia from London in the early 90s, mm -hmm. 92, uh, the scene in Kuala Lumpur was very different. Aside from Ramli Ibrahim, mm -hmm. who still, bless him, is so active, Yes, but there yes. hardly is, was anyone at that time producing mm. the kind of work that's being produced now. Many things changed it. One was the formation of Aswara or mm -hmm. Academy Seni Kebangsaan. Mm -hmm. But also that Actors Studio opened its theatre. Mm -hmm. So we had private spaces that was available to young artists to create work and to stage and produce work rather cheaply. Mm -hmm. So we didn't have to worry so much about... Uh, was that one of the biggest challenges? To actually have funds for performances? Yes, definitely. And it still is a challenge in Malaysia because mm -hmm. Malaysia doesn't quite have the similar uh, funding structures that Singapore has, for mm -hmm. example. Being our nearest neighbour, yeah. it's easiest to compare with them. Mm -hmm. Singapore has a National Arts Council mm -hmm. that funds performing artists and groups in a very clear and structured way. And mm -hmm. they have a very obvious and transparent method mm -hmm. of applying for lo uh, loans and funds and grants and so on and so mm -hmm. forth. And it ranges from performances to education to workshops and for international tours. Mm -hmm. So the range of what is available in Singapore is simply not available, not available in, here. in Malaysia which till brings, today. Which brings me promptly to the next question before I insist we go for class. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> do, do you ever think that you know, dance can ever be seen or rather dance and performing arts can be seen as a commodity? as a viable and legitimate way to make money for the nation? <sighs> you have Big asked question. Yeah, <laughs> serious questions, you know, Dino. Uh, I believe that if I didn't believe it was possible mm -hmm. that dance uh, can become a commodity, mm -hmm. that it can become an industry, if I didn't believe it was possible, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing today. I think that I must consistently fight together with a lot of wonderful Malaysian artists mm -hmm. to work towards helping and build that industry and helping create an industry that allows for contemporary dance performances, uh, companies, uh, since I'm primarily in dance, but also for musical theatre companies. For uh, We don't have, for example, a Royal Shakespeare Company. Right. I'm talking about similar structures. We don't have a Singapore Ballet Company. We don't have uh, a London Contemporary Ballet Company. Mm -hmm. We don't have uh, Pina Bausch. We don't have a million things we don't have. Mm -hmm. So people like myself, are working towards that kind of a goal, right. you know. And so where are you right now? Oh, still, <laughs> still miles away, still miles away, you know. We don't have an arts-loving nation. Right. I think that is one of our biggest problems. But we're on the way. I certainly hope so. Right. Yeah. I mean, judging from number of students you have here and, and the energy again shown yes. by these students, I think we are well on the way, perhaps. Correct me if I'm wrong. You're very optimistic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I'd like to believe so. Mm -hmm. And certainly, having the number of students that we have in Aswara today, as compared to just three or five or ten years ago, mm -hmm. is certainly uh, exponentially increased, mm -hmm. uh, the intake. 
But we are not just talking about numbers. We are talking about the quality. We are talking about the passion. We are talking about people who do it because if they don't dance or sing or act, they die. You know, we do, we are, we are talking about that level of passion and yeah. commitment. Um, I'm not sure I see it enough. Mm -hmm. Although the numbers are greatly increased from before. Yeah, so the journey is long, but there are signs, positive signs, that it could be happening. Right. Yeah. Let's go meet some of these signs, these people that are making this journey happening for you. We'll see you again in a bit. Come. Yes, yes. Let's go Let's. dance. <laughs> Sebelas Oktober, Astro Awani membawakan liputan khas pilihan raya kecil Bagan Pina. Perang poster antara Barisan Nasional dan PAS makin hangat. BN bukan saja berpeluang menang, pemuda kini bersedia untuk menggerak gempurkan jenteranya dalam usaha memastikan kemenangan kakal. Liputan adil dan tepat serta analisis menyeluruh mengambil kira pandangan dan semua pihak termasuklah pengundi. Serta ikuti analisis khas keputusan pilihan raya kecil Bagan Pina 8.15 malam hanya di Astro Awani, Berita Segenap Dimensi. Okay, I am officially about to just collapse and drop <laughs> dead here. This is what, seven years of not dancing, you know, does to your body. Yes. But as healthy as that exercise was and as exciting as it was to me, a lot of people out there who don't understand the art form might just say, what you're doing is frivolous. Yes. What have you got to say about that? Well, I think there's certainly uh, an element of dance that is primarily catered towards um, entertainment, mm -hmm. pure entertainment. So mm -hmm. it's not perhaps frivolous, but you know, a way that people let off steam, get rid of extra, excess tension and energy and so on. But the kind of work that we are working towards is uh, not serious dancing. And I don't want to sound very precious about it, but, mm -hmm. but really to, to bring um, a dance form to an art, dance to an art form. Mm -hmm. And therefore the element of seriousness is involved as part of the process mm -hmm. because you're talking about training and improving standards and quality and being able to uh, hone your skills to a high level mm -hmm. so the 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 approach is certainly different and i know that many people might consider this uh, like uh, pastime that is not really beneficial to mankind mm -hmm. but the truth is i think that man has always danced you know, from the time a baby is coming out of the body, mm -hmm. oh, in fact, when the baby's in the womb, mm -hmm. is also so much movement and mm -hmm. it's dancing, you know. So I think the interpretation of dance and movement is, is really much wider. Mm -hmm. So um, what I, I, I see this as really an ex, uh, as a way for us to express ourselves uh, beyond words and text and using another medium. This, in fact, is the only medium of art where the artist is the art. Is the art, yes. So I think that that is really very interesting and very important to mm -hmm. me. And therefore, uh, you know, I view it as something I hope public perception will change as time goes on. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's one of the battles that we have to... Well, now that you've put it in that way, um, another aspect of dance that I have actually long believed in is that dance is probably the only art form where it is only an art when it is being performed. When if it is photographed or filmed, then it's a photography or a film of a dance, but the dance is an instantaneous thing of that time, in particular point of time. Yes. So bearing that in mind, where do you think is the place of traditional, uh, other traditional art form, dance, uh, such as, you know, Mengadap Rebab of Mak Yong, uh, and even you know other movements like the Borea in Penang, where is the place for those forms of art in today's society? Is it disappearing? Yeah. Well, I think the truth is that it's disappearing. Mm -hmm. The truth is that it's just not performed as much as it has been performed in the past. And you have mentioned beautiful examples, you know. You've really given and hit the nail on the head. Mm -hmm. When we talk about Mangadap Rabab, when we talk about Ma'yom, when we talk about Borea or Tari Piring yeah. or Tari Inai, Tari Nai, any of the classical court forms, um, 
I, I really don't have the answer as to where, what place it, it can play in society today. But I do believe that if Malaysia was able to train or build, I should say, mm -hmm. uh, a community, an arts-loving community, an arts-loving population, then by, by nature, these dancers would perhaps live on. Mm -hmm. For example, if it was constantly performed at weddings, and uh, for example, if you look at Bollywood, mm -hmm. Now, nearly every movie has a wedding scene <laughs> right, and yes. everybody is doing uh, the dances of the, yes. you know, the Gujaratis or the Hindustanis mm -hmm. or whoever. So in that case, Malaysian dance, we, we, our society has changed in such a way that when we go to a wedding, we expect to sit down at a table and have a wonderful 10 course meal mm -hmm. and we expect to be entertained. Right. Mm -hmm. And we are not part of that entertainment and we don't partake of the ritual of dancing as part of the wedding which mm -hmm. is how it used to be before and sometimes it still is in villages in Malaysia mm -hmm. but certainly not in sort of civilized societies you know and um, maybe upper class uh, families you know mm -hmm. it doesn't become it's not second nature so the anymore. onus is not on the viewer to take part yeah and that's probably one of the reasons it's disappearing I think so you know mm -hmm. and of course we have very serious issues that have to be discussed when we're talking about performing arts in this country, which is the socio-political situation. Mm -hmm. When you talk about dance, you have to look at the context of dance. For example, in a state that is run by the past government, that views performing arts in a particular way and mm -hmm. has so many restrictions or completely restricts performing arts by women mm -hmm. and female artists. So this in its nature also definitely hinders the art form from growing and you have a perception that because of Malaysia's and Southeast Asia's um, you know, Hindu influence of the mm -hmm. uh, centuries yeah, ago, yeah, uh -huh. you know, and the animism, animistic beliefs of the people of Sabah, Sarawak and the yeah. others, that, 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 that di difference between culture and religion is so blurred. Right. And I think this is really one of the problems in our country that we have to talk about and we have to deal yeah. with it, you know? Somehow or other, yes. somebody has to... There must the be dialogue yeah. about this and there must be a solution because, quite honestly, I mean, I love Malay culture. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I immerse myself in things like the Mangarat Rabab or the mm -hmm. Yong and so on. I, I am enthralled by Zapin and Piring and all those beautiful forms, you know? And I just, I am fearful that because there is misinterpretation or a lack of understanding about the context of dance within culture, society and religion and so on, mm -hmm. that we might end up with a race that is devoid of, of culture. culture and, and its uh, traditions. Yeah. That's a very sad day if that does happen. And very yeah. serious, which is why places like Aswara are and people very, like very you, and people like, and people like you, <laughs> who's fighting so hard to keep it alive I guess and, so, I guess. and sustain it. Speaking of mengadak rebab, I say let's go and see Lepanggong here. Okay. How about, let's go and have a sit down. Okay, it just comes to show I am actually quite breathless. <laughs> You just have to make more in this economy downturn and increase profitability to stay or to quit. But where do you go from there? Share the experiences of some of the brightest sparks in Malaysia. More of that in Focus Economy every Monday, 11.30 p.m. on Astro Awani. Anda sudah semua? Sila pakai penutup mulut dan hidung. Pesanan dari Kementerian Kesihatan. How do you go there? Eh, 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 eh. <laughs> no, but right. Um, now, coming back onto you, what's your flavor? Big shows or small intimate gatherings? Um, For the kind of stuff that you like to do. I'm a very, um, perhaps uh, an odd Malaysian, mm -hmm. you know, in the, in the sense that my range of skills as well as my range of taste is really, really broad and diverse. Mm -hmm. Because I have the experience of performing in the West End, right. and I really guess it doesn't get bigger than that. Mm -hmm. And I have performed uh, musical theater at Istana Budaya, at Infinity Productions, Piramli. So these were huge productions. 
but I also have performed in a very intimate setting with maybe only 40 or 50 people in maybe a restaurant in Kuala Lumpur that's having an evening of uh, poetry readings mm -hmm. or um, some kind of interpretation that is maybe more avant-garde. I think each type of performance really brings a different kind of feeling mm -hmm. or quality or challenge. And, and very honestly, I'm really, uh, you know, born to do this. So okay. I guess I love everything. I love all kinds and all shapes and all sizes. Right. So there's actually m many things that you have done and you would still like to try and you yes. would like to impart that onto the students as well. Not speaking about the students, you know, let's talk about the prospects for them. I mean, today's society, you cannot help but to talk about job, money, you know, longevity, how to earn a living. So what are the job prospects for the students here that you've thought, you mm. know, is there a market for them? Is there any money for them in, you know, in the future? Um, or is this something that they learn, but they're going to have to do a part-time job just to keep this? Yes, which is what we don't want, right? No, we don't. Uh, yes. uh, I think the idea to have this academy is really that to train uh, artists not just to be skillful in uh, control of their bodies, but also to be uh, entrepreneurial mm -hmm. and to think about the business possibilities of dance. Mm -hmm. So this means that they could look into the aspects of uh, uh, marketing performances, management, uh, opening dance as business opportunities like private dance schools and so on. Right. And this is really, I mean, we have some very wonderful examples in Malaysia of people who have made huge successes of their, their ballet schools. And mm -hmm. Federal Academy of Ballet, for example, is one of them. So um, the fear is there because the bodies are only going to last so long. Mm -hmm. But I think the trends in the world have shown us that you can dance if that's what you want to do well into your 40s. Mm -hmm. uh, Margot Fontaine did it till she was 60. Yeah. Uh, Cole Mirabushi is still doing it at the age of 70. Um, the question I think really is to enable and empower the artist to, if there is no industry available, to create that industry, right. to be proactive in trying to find a path for themselves, mm -hmm. you know. I didn't know what I was going to do and I when I started this adventure, <laughs> you know, uh, 25, 30 years ago. I had no idea that this is where it would lead me right. to. But because now I have that experience, I'm trying to tell the, the, the younger dancers that these are possibilities. I've made dance my career. It's mm -hmm. my life. There's research and more universities today are offering dance as an educational uh, part mm -hmm. than ever before. So we need to look at all these possibilities. You need to think about postgraduate studies. You need to look at... Uh, uh, and also a very good thing is that uh, government-run uh, companies such as uh, Istana Budaya or uh, other companies such as that have now increased salaries for dancers. And then there is a career pathway mm -hmm. for them within the framework of a state-funded com company. You mm -hmm. know? Ten years ago, there wasn't any private theatre, but today mm -hmm. there is. So you can move into one production to another. So there are, it, it's really much better than it was before, mm -hmm. but it's still a long, hard struggle. Right. The stigma is still there. I believe so. The stigma yes. is, I mean, you know, the, the things said in Piramli films, Anna Wayang. Yes, you know? <laughs> yes, yes. So, uh, that, I'm sure, is part of your battle, trying to change that perception and making it into a legitimate yes. um, art form. In anything that we do and in any cause that we try to champion, there is always a possible figure that we could put forth as a hero to that cause. Uh, you've mentioned names like uh, Margot Fontaine and uh, we've got someone like Rami Ibrahim. Now, if you had to, the opportunity to choose a dancer, a local figure from the dance industry, as the hero and this is sort of like an indirect message to this person that says hey you let's champion this who would that person be i think um well it's a very <laughs> a very <laughs> tough question that you've asked now um i think ramli ibrahim really he stands head and shoulders above everybody else in the path that his life has taken in the the, the performances that he has produced in the efforts that he has championed. Um, and aside from Sutra Dance Theatre, he has got Sutra House, mm -hmm. Sutra Foundation and so on. So I think if, if that would be a model for somebody to follow, mm -hmm. I think that would be the model mm -hmm. of somebody who's really um, 
really achieved it and it's not through it's through sheer hard work mm -hmm. a lot of support I think he will be the first to tell you um, but I believe that will be the path the way to go right okay I suppose it's a very acceptable answer so you've passed <laughs> <laughs> and we're coming towards the end of the interview now we've only got about a minute or so now let's let's just pick things up a little bit you know um, in the many years, in the 30 years that you've had in the dance industry, both yes. as a performer, as a teacher, as everything, as a choreographer, what would you say is the funniest, hilarious, most hilarious bit that has ever happened to you in the last 30 years? Oh Something my Something that you probably would not, you know, want to repeat. <laughs> Something I wouldn't want to repeat. Yes. I told you what my story was, my trousers coming under well, the Well, actually, it's a, similar, <laughs> it's a similar story. Uh, but it happened very early on in my career, you know. Uh, and when we you were, were naive and green. <laughs> <laughs> and it was so funny because that's exactly what happened. I was dancing with Kasuma, Kastanian University, Malaya. Yep. And we had gone to Thailand and Hong Kong for a performance, you know. Uh -huh. And because we had to come in and out of the theatre, um, <laughs> Doing, doing one dance after another. So the way to solve the problem was to put all the, layer, costumes, all the yeah. costumes on and then yeah. as the dance went on, you peel off the layers and so on and so forth. Yes. And it so happened that one of my friends, we were doing the Suma Zhao. Uh -huh. And you know, as you know, the Suma yeah. Zhao, the dance is here. Yeah. The hands are, are, you know, at shoulder level and it goes back and forth. But at that particular point, the, my friend's pants started slipping down. And so we had this really hilarious version of the Sumaza where he kept, kept his hands kept, kept coming down. So he had to keep pulling up his pants with one hand, two hands, and in the end he pulled it up with both hands and then tried this and this. I will never forget. And Aznil Haji Nawawi, yeah. who is a very big star in Astro, mm -hmm. he was one of the dancers in that piece. Right. And it was absolutely hilarious. You know, I'm sure my friend didn't think so at that time. But later we found it very funny. Right? You know what? I'm going to go and ask, ask Neil about this. Yes, he'll probably remember. <laughs> yes. But just so thank you so much. Thank it you. Yes. Fantastic. It has been enlightening thank and you. it has been very refreshing on my back, especially. <laughs> thank okay. you so much for watching in person. You've been with me, Seth Fredino Omar, and the fabulous Joseph Gonzalez. <laughs> thank you. We'll see you again soon. Bye bye.